Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Meet the Bites. In this special episode, I do have someone special. That's why it's a special episode. We have Chris Conrad. And why is this a special episode? Because his name is Chris as well. No, I'm just joking. Uh, for those of you who don't know Chris Conrad, Chris is actually the VP of Engineering here at Airbyte. But beside that though, Chris, you have a very interesting story. I think number one is that you stay at one company for a very long time. I've spoken to many different software engineers where every two to three years, we move from one company to another. Why? Because that's kind of one of the ways to, to move up the ladder, obviously get much better pay by doing that. But you stayed out one company seven years at a time. And just to, to mention for people who don't know you, you've, you've been in tech for a while, but the companies that many people might know or should know is number one, you were at LinkedIn for seven years. That's the company you're at. And then from LinkedIn, you moved to WePay. You were there for seven years, right? And, mm -hmm. and, not, and not even including that, just to add on top of that, you were at LinkedIn when they IPO'd, and you were at mm -hmm. WePay when WePay was acquired by JP Morgan. Uh, before we move into the meat of this interview of LinkedIn and WePay and just everything in general, um, how's your first six or seven months been here? A and when I and when I say this, like comparing to your first year or so at even, let's say WePay or LinkedIn, because you were number one hundred fifty at LinkedIn, one forty nine to be exact. Oh, I apologize, one forty nine. <laughs> Actually, it might have been one fifty nine. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. somewhere around there. So how, how would you compare that? I'm really curious, looking at your history in tech. You know, all three companies were really different. And so it's a little bit hard to compare them because especially like LinkedIn, it was 2007. Mm -hmm. We were hosted in data centers. So, you know, like we had system administrators, we had network operations people, the cloud mm -hmm. didn't exist. Though, uh, ironically, sure. the service that I worked on was called the cloud. So very confusing, <laughs> but um, had nothing to do with cloud computing. Uh, but no, it was it was a very different environment. It was a very different sort of uh, time, you know, obviously pre-COVID as well with the offices and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it felt different uh, in many ways. The space is also different. LinkedIn's very consumer. Um, we pay and to some extent, Airbyte are much more enterprise, which gives a little bit of a different feel when it comes to how you attract and sell to customers and all of that yes. kind of stuff. And um, I think both WePay and Airbyte sort of had a plan and a way to make money. And when I joined LinkedIn, they did not really know how they were going to make money. Uh, so it, it was, it's yes. been different. It's uh, different environments. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, I think Airbyte, even despite the fact that it's a it's a newer company, it's a younger company than either LinkedIn or WePay was when old. I joined. Yeah, it, it uh, both of the the other two I think were about four years old when, when I joined. You joined. Them. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn was founded in two thousand three. Yes. Took took a while to figure out how to how to grow and become what it is today. So it took them four but, years uh, to reach one hundred fifty, one hundred sixty employees. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Again, it was a different time. Yeah, different, <laughs> different time technology, right different speed. But uh, yes. but no, uh, Airbyte is, I think, in some ways, a, a bit more sophisticated in some areas. Uh, understands what they're trying to do is a little bit better positioned. I think the open source nature helps with that a lot. You know, it's really easy when you're not having to try to sell people to use your product to gain that kind of adoption and understand what your customers are doing and what it looks like and how to be successful. Okay, I, I really wanna dive into this because we only have so much time. Sure. So you, you joined LinkedIn, you were in tech for a while already, you joined LinkedIn. How did that happen? Because there was no LinkedIn before LinkedIn, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and that's the majority of how even I find jobs, a lot of people in tech find jobs, people in general find jobs. How did mm -hmm. that happen? How did you become 159 or 149 at LinkedIn? So I'm going 159 now. So okay. it was. Uh, it's a funny story. It actually was professional networking. Uh, so the the database administrator, his name is Adia Lurker. Um, he was the database administrator for SourceForge.net, which is where I was before I went to LinkedIn. And he went to LinkedIn. How he found mm -hmm. LinkedIn, I have no idea. Uh, but he joined LinkedIn. He was there. He spent probably a year trying to convince me to join before I finally was willing to leave SourceForge and go to LinkedIn. And you know if. One of the great wow. mistakes of my life, they I missed the, I think it was a three for one stock split between oh. when I was first asked to join LinkedIn and when yes. I finally got there. But um, but yeah, no, it, it was a professional networking thing. So he could, he introduced me to Jean-Luc Viant, who was the CTO at mm -hmm. LinkedIn at the time. Uh, JL and I met, I think it was at a Java One in 2006. 
And then I finally went through the interview process and joined in July 2007. Wow. And were you interviewed? I, I would imagine at that size still, 150, you would probably interviewed by maybe Reed Hoffman as well? No, Reed actually wasn't at the company full time at that point. Oh, wow. He was mainly an investor at the time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He, okay. he stepped out of operating duties and uh, there was a different CEO at the time. Okay. So I did spend wow. time with um, the CTO and I spent time with, so the, the group that I was interviewing with was called the office of the CTO. And mm -hmm. it was a small group working on some of the bigger, higher scale projects like the search engine and mm -hmm. the cloud project that I mentioned is, uh, was their social graph database. And wow, so that okay. was sort of the thing that I was working on was the social graph database. How, how was that though? Joining at a company, uh, I mean, did, did you, uh, this is a curious question then, did you know that LinkedIn would eventually do? It took them a while to really pop off, right? But No, nobody knew that. I mean, we were, the company was growing, but it wasn't growing tremendously fast. Mm -hmm. I want to say there was approximately 10 million users on LinkedIn when I joined. Uh, we used to go back behind the loading dock at the office and they would take pictures of the team uh, every million users. And so you could see the difference oh. and the team growing and growing and growing. And then they switched and they only did it after uh, we were doing it like every hundred million users after we hit a hundred million. When we got to bigger numbers, it just didn't make sense to do it every million. It was actually about the financial crisis that yes. really juiced our growth. That's so interesting. Enough. Why? How so? A lot of people got laid off. Yeah. And I think that what ended up happening, what we, were, we would be putting up these um, these newspapers and frames in the office where some newspaper would have an article about, you know, so and so some random person in that town got hired because of LinkedIn. They their resume was on LinkedIn. And so or someone that's found a good them on way LinkedIn to or, advertise. Oh, that's smart. Well, it wasn't really our advertising. We really didn't even know that this was a thing. And then we started seeing it and, and things started to grow and grow and grow. And so I remember we. Uh, we, wow. we laid off a big chunk of the recruiting team because we were going to freeze hiring. Uh, you know, a story that people are hearing a lot these days now, too. Yep. <laughs> and But the, the growth kicked off, and all of a sudden we were rehiring all of those recruiters yeah. three or six months later to, wow. to try to start hiring quicker because we were seeing the, the user growth as people were coming in to try to find ways to get jobs during the depths of the Great Recession. You no, know what the Now that I think about it, Kafka's huge. And I believe yeah. one of the Kafka creators came from LinkedIn or did all of them come from LinkedIn? Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Kafka was totally created at LinkedIn. Okay. Um, all, the three co-founders of Confluent, uh, Jay, June, and Neha yeah. were all ex-LinkedIn. All ex-LinkedIn. Did you know any of them? Yep. I knew all three of them. Really? Uh, wow. Ironically, Jay and I, our tenure at LinkedIn, I, I don't know his exact start date, but uh, we were both in the same CEO uh, new employee lunch. So I know that we joined within days or a week or two of each other uh -huh. in 2007. And our last day was the exact same day. Uh, we actually had, <laughs> we ended up having a kind of joint, uh, <laughs> going away party at sports page down the street from LinkedIn. Cause we both like, we were, we were working in different groups at that time. So I didn't know that he was leaving and he didn't know that I was leaving. Wow. And that was just, so we, but we had enough overlapping folks that we were, um, colleagues with for that time uh wow. jay and i were two of the six or seven or eight founding members of the search network and analytics team at linkedin okay so there so i i worked next to you know he was within a few desks of me <laughs> for years at linkedin how, how I mean, I mean, you've been in tech for a while so maybe this is normal now for you not for me but how is it to just see you know be working with someone just like you you know and seeing them build this company confluent that everyone uses so many people use no it's awesome i mean you know i jay's a great guy i always enjoyed working with him he always had interesting ideas um he was always extremely exuberant about that space i remember really? i don't know if you ever read his everything's a log blog not. post that he wrote but i it's more of a manifesto it's like a novella in length it's not really a blog post and the, I, the thing that i remember uh and if you want to make a mistake is he he came i don't remember if it was breakfast or lunch one day and he wanted me to read his post before he he put it up and yeah. it's you know thousands of words i'm like jay this is too long i'm not going to review <laughs> your 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 mini book uh, i think o'reilly eventually published it as a book which is amazing uh, but, <laughs> which is amazing 
Um, but no, it's, it's great. There's, there's lots of people that I know from LinkedIn that have gone on and done interesting, exciting things at different things. You know, uh, other people I worked, uh, close uh, or not worked directly closely with, but like in very close physical proximity with, uh, DJ Patil, who eventually went, he was, I, don't know, I think he was like CTO of the United States of America under o president Obama. Jeez. Um, there's, you know, interesting folks that came from other companies, wow. Jeff Wiener and David Hankey from Yahoo and hearing the stories about Yahoo and with David even going back, he was a SGI employee. And so, you know, he would talk about how the, cause the Google campus and right where LinkedIn is on Shoreline was all SGI. Mm -hmm. And so he was, would always talk about how these were the buildings he worked in when he was just starting in tech, cause he was a SGI employee back in the day. And so, you know, the, there was a lot of exciting, interesting people. Is, is there anything with all of these people who, who grew their own companies, did amazing things later in their career, is there anything in particular that they all had or that you would notice in them that, okay, you see where they are now, that makes sense? Is there any particular traits, mm -hmm. habits that maybe I can learn, that you can give help me learn right now so I can build it? Yeah, it's so I think that some of those things are, are a little bit luck. You know, one of the things that's funny about Kafka is Kafka was originally an experiment that Jay did. Uh, that he wanted to see, so he was doing two things. He wanted to learn the Scala programming language and he was trying to do some benchmarking on how fast could you write linearly, read and write to a spinning disc because everything was spinning hard drives back yep. in the 2008, 2009 era. And so originally it was just an attempt to read and write data linearly or in a log on a spinning disk and then you add networking and a whole bunch of additional features and you end up with Kafka. So that was something that sort of grew very organically in, mm -hmm. inside the company. And I think that the thing that you could see when you look at somebody that's doing that, or the thing that you could see when you look at other folks that have had good careers is it's the ambition and the motivation to work at it. Um, you know, it, it, that's really something that I try to, I've been trying to instill with my kids yeah. is not everything is easy the first time you do it, yes. but that doesn't mean that you stop. It doesn't mean that just because it's hard, you decide to, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do the easy thing. Mm -hmm. You got to figure out how to be, have that perseverance and, and just keep going at it and figure it out um, and have the ambition to, to succeed and, and sort of not let yourself be number two in mm -hmm. that, if that makes Even sense. You know, it's not a, number one. It's not all about being number one, and yeah. or but it, you have to make sure that you have the ambition to to position yourself and set yourself up. Being at a startup, mm. you have the opportunity. I would always tell interns uh, at WePay because I, I would have lunch at least once on a one on one with every intern at WePay. Yeah, and one of the things that really helps their career in a situation like that, and I I had this at, at LinkedIn as well, is if you go to Google. Or if you go to Microsoft, you know, I know Kevin Scott, he ran engineering at mm -hmm. LinkedIn. He's the CTO of Microsoft now. Kevin this Scott does not have lunch with every intern at Microsoft. Had lunch with you. Uh, he does not have the time <laughs> to do it. He probably would love to do yeah. it, but he doesn't have the time to do it. I mean, there's so many people at Microsoft. I, I, have, I can't imagine how many hundreds or thousands of interns they have every year. Uh, but, you know, if you're at a place like a WePay or if you're at an Airbyte or if you're at an earlier startup, you have the opportunity to sit down and have lunch with the head of engineering, to have yes. lunch with principal engineers, to have lunch with people like that that can sort of take you under their wing and propel you. Everyone who's done well in the career, they are where they are today because of just consistency and really making the goal to be number one. You may not always become mm -hmm. number one, but with that goal in mind, working towards that goal, I mean, aim for the stars, you hit something, right? absolutely that's amazing and, and okay so now i want to talk about this next part so you were at linkedin you were there before the ipo every engineer who mm -hmm. joins a startup i joined a startup that would be amazing to ipo or get acquired for a big chunk of money right so you were there when they, were, mm -hmm. they ipo'd how was how was it to experience it was i'm assuming that's your first time to experience that yeah, it was my first time. It was my one and only IPO experience. And, and you didn't expect that to happen. I mean, not a lot of people expect it to happen when they join a startup. You hope it happens. And it happened for you, which is very rare. Yeah, very, very rare. Doesn't happen often. No expectation when I joined. Exactly. LinkedIn. And it yeah. happened. Did you have any signs? Of, did you know ahead of time or any sign? I mean, actually, you probably can't know. That's not, it's not legal. But any signs, right, that probably got you excited. All right, we're about to IPO. We're going to make some money on that. Anything about that before ahead of time? Well, <clears throat> LinkedIn, 
again, it was a little bit of a different era, ever, a different era. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, there were things like second market mm -hmm. that were kicking around. And so, you know, unlike some of the private companies today that are just private forever and ever and ever, it, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, like there was a real big market for their, their stock uh, before their mm -hmm. IPOs. And so you did have an abnormally high amount of visibility into sort of the real market value mm. of the equity as the companies yeah. were growing. And, you know, you, you did have a perception of excitement around the company. It was certainly, you don't grow from 125, 140 people. Like it was when I joined to, you know, we were getting close. We were about, I think, 1,200 when mm. we IPO'd. And then three years later when I left, we were at about 10,000, 12,000. big jump. You, you're not growing that fast if you're not experiencing, you know, real success. Yes. And we were experiencing that real success. You could see the growth, you know, you start, when you start, you go from taking pictures of every million new users to only taking pictures every hundred million new mm -hmm. users, you're, you're, you can see that happening around you. So it wasn't a surprise not a necessarily. Surprise. Yeah, okay. That makes sense now, which is a good thing if it's not a surprise. I mean, I would love to just know, all right, it's going to happen any, any year now, every, any month now, any day now, that's exciting. And that IPO, it happened. How was that transition from, you know, being a uh, private company, IPO, becoming public. Um, how was that experience? I'm sure everyone wants to know. So it was, yeah, it, it's, it is a very high moment. Well, it, it's, it, especially living in Silicon Valley, you get the weird thing of um, you're, because the market opens so early in the morning, uh, Pacific time, you know, you've got the team in the cafeteria yeah. with the TVs all turned, tuned into CNBC but it's it's like six thirty seven o'clock in the morning, and so you're you're not used to getting up that early. And then you've got people popping cor champagne corks, and you know everything's pretty crazy. You've got people that are you know like passed out drunk <laughs> by lunchtime that day. So I think the the weird thing, and this was there's a cultural thing at LinkedIn that I think is was an interesting side of this because one of the things that David Hankey was saying, one of the the cultural thing is is Jeff Weiner had a thing uh, next play. There's, I'm not a basketball fan. I guess there's some basketball, college basketball coach who next play was mm -hmm. his thing. Like you, you don't want to stop and celebrate in the mm -hmm. middle of a game, uh, especially in a sport yeah. like basketball. You score a basket. You don't want to You got to score, you know, 40 or 50 more before mm -hmm. you're actually going to yep. win the game. Go so you just, you just can't stop and celebrate mm -hmm. right then. But the thing about a company is you, there is no end per yeah. se. Uh, every end is is another beginning. And so the day that you IPO, you're no longer a private company, but yeah. you're still a company. You're just a public company now. And so you have to take the moment to celebrate, but then make sure that you get your head back in the game because tomorrow you got to show up for work and you know we still have things that we need to deliver. And, and now it's even harder because now it's not just, are we meeting our internal goals and our internal metrics, but how yes. do we keep Wall yes. Street happy? How do we hit our quarterly earnings? It changes and everything. So yeah. on and so forth. It, it changes a lot. Day to day. So I, I think after the IPO, the day of the IPO, it was really exciting. There were people having a great time. Uh, it was a little bit weird. We had lots of extra security on campus just because we didn't want like random mm -hmm. reporters yeah. or, you know, a crazy person showing up and causing trouble. But then, then it goes back to it goes back day to, to day. day to day, except that now you, you know, you're trying to not bring up the LinkedIn stock yeah. ticker every i'm sure for the next couple see. months everyone's looking at that <laughs> everyone's looking at it and then but you've got the six month lockup window how, how does it feel then prior to the six months lockout window you seeing the numbers go up down up down how was that it's fine yeah. fine i mean i the the nice thing about linkedin is it mostly went up that is nice months. there wasn't a lot <laughs> That's of down very nice now as soon as the six months ran out because it went down a sold. lot because all of a sudden you had a lot of yeah, employees of selling uh, hopefully you sold fast enough. But then it just started marching yeah. up again. That makes sense. Wow. And how was that experience? Oh, it sorry. did. I think that, well, I was going to say, I think the, big, the biggest change was it made recruiting harder. Because all of a sudden with the stock price going up, you know, you're a new company. You just went public. The stock price yeah. is going up. Like we were still trying to give people yeah. options and people were saying, I don't, I don't know if I want to get a LinkedIn option at 80 or 90 or a hundred dollars yeah. a share. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we IPO would at forty dollars a share. So, like, is it possible that this is a little irrational and mm -hmm. it's going to drop? Sure. Uh, so we had to figure out how to, like, what what do comp packages mm -hmm. look like after the IPO? That's stuff interesting, like that. but good problem to have too. So, so you're at LinkedIn mm -hmm. for seven years. You were there when they IPO'd. You left LinkedIn. 
right? And I'm sure you had yep. a, a good amount of uh, um, it's not it's RCs, it's not uh, um options anymore. You had a good amount of RCs. Yeah. I had both. Wow, that's <laughs> post IPO. They they issued. Uh, Do you R- keep you, your amount of stock you options the between the two? Like for example, let's say you receive eight thousand options per year. Does that remain the same? And then you get RCs. I, I have no idea how that works. Well, so the way LinkedIn worked, and this is definitely mm-hmm. company by company, is you had your initial grant. And if you were, so my initial grant ran out before the IPO, but because I was an employee that they wanted to keep, they gave me a, a, a second grant, uh, obviously yeah. much smaller. And obviously the strike price was a lot higher, but I got a second grant. And then thereafter, RSUs are just part of the way that they do your total compensation. Yeah. So you've got some cash, you've got some bonus, and you've got equity. And they sort of track how much equity you have and make sure that you've got the right amount of equity to keep you incentivized to stay at the company. Now, you leave Air- uh, you leave LinkedIn after seven years, which is very interesting, and you join another startup. Mm-hmm. And it's because there was, um, there was not really a project that I wanted to work at LinkedIn that I felt was going to give me the personal growth that was exciting at that point. Uh, there actually was a project about six months later that they reached out to me for and said, hey, would you like to run this thing? And I was like, you know, if this was available six months ago, I might have said <laughs> yes, but I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to come back right now. I'm sorry, guys, because uh, I left on great terms. I'm still I mean, a lot of the people that were, you know, my boss and my mentors there have also subsequently left mm. LinkedIn. Um, but the you know, I was very close to them. I, I stay close to a lot of them still today. And there it's. It was a it was a great community, a lot of great people to work with. But um, you know, I wanted to do something different, and so uh, WePay just seemed like a good opportunity, and so I went for it. What what was it about WePay that you saw as a good opportunity? Was it uh, I believe you you were a director at LinkedIn? Did you become a VP at WePay as well? Yeah, you did. Okay, I did. I was nice. a VP at, at at WePay. There was there was a couple things that I was I was interested. One is I kind of wanted to get rid of the safety net so to speak how come because that that's what i want everyone wants the safety net right who doesn't want that that's what everyone wants in life in general right well i wanted to give it a try without it and see what it was like well i i did but you know there's this goes i think back to a little bit that ambition Mm. and in startups you know the irrationality of believing that things are going to go well sort of despite what's happening day to day and so my I, I wanted to try it without wow. the safety net. And, the, you know, the WePay story is a little bit interesting because uh, pre-IPO, Square tried to recruit me. Uh, there was a bun- there was a few LinkedIn people that went up to Square and they were trying to pull other people in. And so I, I did a presentation at a Scala Days conference and I don't remember what year it was. It was the year that volcano in Iceland erupted because I was stuck in Geneva for a week because of the volcano in Iceland. Uh, I went up and I, I chatted with the Square folks about the stuff that we were doing. And the thing that was interesting about fintech is we were operating at high scale mm-hmm. at LinkedIn. The service that I was working on was doing some massive, you know, million queries per second kind of scale of operations. And we, I, I the thing about fintech is it doesn't do high scale like that. There's There's a lot of high scale, but it's not that type of high scale that social media does, but the difference is you're dealing with real money. And so bugs, problems, you send the wrong amount of money to the wrong person. And that's bad, like real bad. (laughs) And so yeah, you, there's a, you're not focusing on scalability. You're now focusing on like reliability. You're focusing on durability. You're focusing, you're having to solve problems that are not scale focused, but still very interesting. And so I wanted to give my, and so the square opportunity was interesting from that perspective, but less interesting because I didn't totally understand how their product was going to be as successful as it ended up being. Looking back, looking back, do you wish you would have joined square? Joined square? No. No, I, I probably did better at LinkedIn nice. than I would have at Square. Wow, that's impressive. That Those are some big, strong words right there. Uh, okay, so then you moved to WePay. You moved to WePay. You're there for seven years, mm-hmm. six years? Seven years as well, I believe. I remember looking at your LinkedIn. I mean, technically three and a half, and then it was JP Morgan okay. for another three and yeah, a half. That makes sense. Yeah, so seven, seven years. Seven year. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about too. So you're at WePay. You're there for about three and a half years. After three and a half years, you get acquired by JP Morgan, just like LinkedIn. Did you see signs of that happening, of WePay being acquired by a company? Well, it was a little bit different. Being on okay. the executive team. Wow. 
How was that then? Oh my gosh. How, how was that? Being an executive in those meetings, hearing about this stuff in advance way before any uh, engineers, employees learn about it, right? How was that from that perspective? Way different from LinkedIn. It was way different. It was, um, it, the, the thing is, is that I knew, but it was also very mm. much more speculative. Uh, LinkedIn, by the time we knew, or by the time you sort of, it's not like we IPO'd and nobody knew it was going to happen, right? There mm. was, we knew it was going to happen. The S1 came out. There was lots of build up to it. They did all kinds of stuff. They brought in like financial advisors to talk to you about what to do with your money. And they, they went through this whole big process on the, the wind up. You kind of got to see the sausage making. <laughs> And so it was very much more speculative. It's sort of like, you know, you're looking up who is this person that I'm talking to at JP Morgan and do they even have the authority to spend this much money? Um, and wow. so you're, you're kind of like, as you're going through the pitch process and all that kind of stuff, it's a, you don't know what the outcome's necessarily going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, it, there was less assurance, but it was also, you know, pretty exciting. How, how long did that take then from the start of negotiations, right? Or just talking with JP Morgan to actually being acquired? How long was that process? I think it was in the realm of six to nine months. Wow, that's pretty fast. It was, well, to be fair, we were talking to them about, um, I'm going to use some bank terminology or some payments terminology on you here. Uh, we were in talks with them to have them become our primary acquirer. Uh, we were using a different bank at the time and okay. we wanted to, we were trying to get, see what the alternatives were. And so we were talking to a few companies. And so it, wow. really the conversation started with some of the um, talks to have them process money for us uh, before it spun into a, you know, is there partnership opportunities? And then it spun into, is there acquisition opportunities? That's, that's amazing. And it was, there, there wasn't a six month lockout, right? Before you, all your vested options, you just get, no, it, you, receive... you sign a piece of paper and your, your, we pay stock disappeared and they paid out, cash wow that's nice and i'm assuming you had uh, with a you, small caveat they, that there was there was uh there's always a little bit of a hold back that they pay out down the road because you know you they there. well no there was a uh, retention to keep you there but there is a thing i forget i forget specifically what it's called but you know it's a little bit like a warranty where if things mm. are not as represented or if there's underlying issues with the business they can kind of claw back some of the of some of the acquisition sense. cost. So yeah. okay. uh, those paid out further down the road. So you have an amazing career so far. It's not ending yet. Uh, I hope not. LinkedIn. Hope not. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, for myself as well. <laughs> uh, we pay, especially that I'm here at Airbyte and you're here. I feel like you have a really good track record so far. Um, now you're here at Airbyte. You've mm -hmm. experienced IPO. You've experienced being acquired. Not many people have experienced any of that, right? In general, here in, in tech or in Silicon Valley, right? You're here at Airbyte. Why Airbyte then? So I have largely worked on infrastructure-related projects most of my career. I did a small uh, year and a half stint working on the, the LinkedIn homepage, and that was fun. It was great. It was, it was interesting trying to figure those kinds of problems out and how to optimize to drive more traffic and to... Mm you know, daily active, weekly active, monthly active users, and how long are they on the site and all that kind of stuff is a very interesting set of problems to solve. But infrastructure is kind of the, the my, my passion area. And if you go back uh, before LinkedIn, I was at SourceForge, which was mm -hmm. back in the day, the, you know, it was GitHub of its day. It was the biggest open source repository. We were very involved in the open source community. And so an infrastructure project that is also open source really resonated from a, a product market sort of lens. And uh, meeting the team, having the opportunity to chat with various folks in the engineering team, the founders, some of the investors, it was just such a great organization. It seemed like an awesome opportunity. And so when it came down to it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a hard decision on my side to make. Well, that makes me happy to hear. Uh, and what, what do you, this is a big ask, uh, you know, and you answer whatever it may be. What, what do you see everybody going? Right, um, right now, I think this is the year we need to make we need to make a big impact, of course. But like, where do you see Airbyte going? So I don't know that there's ever a year that you need to make a big impact. I think that some people okay. build stuff up in their heads a little bit and <laughs> create a, 
um, you know, you create a little bit of uh, a little bit too much pressure on yourself sometimes. I think. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the next. You sound play. like a great I'm manager, gonna... by the way. You sound like a great manager. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that this goes to the next play idea, right? Like, there's always next play. You, you got to be ready for the next one. You got to be ready to to just step in and do the next thing. And so, if this doesn't work, we're gonna do the next one. If this does work, we're still gonna do the next one. You you always have to be focused on not just today, but, you know, the thing that you're going to do next to make sure that you're keeping the momentum and you're keeping going. And so I, I do think that there's more than one path to victory. And I think that you don't always need to know every day what you need to do tomorrow to be successful. You just got to keep chipping at it. And so at the moment it's, um, you know, how do, how do we continue to make Airbyte a great product, especially mm-hmm. as we think about the sort of pure open source versus the cloud and SaaS, the sort of demands and the, the expectations around SaaS are different. Uh, people are willing to give open source a little bit of a, you, you could you could deal with the rough edges a little bit um, more than maybe you were, are willing to when it comes to, to SaaS. So how do we make sure that we deal with the rough edges? How do we make sure that we can just manage the customers and keep people happy? That is definitely the ultimate goal. Um, I know I'm over time. Can I ask you one really last question uh, really quick? It's about AI. Yeah, for sure. Think um, okay, so this is a last question, and that's on everyone's mind right now. Chat, G- Chat GPT 3.5 was amazing. Chat GPT 4 is out. I use it all the time. Where do you see that impacting software engineering in general uh, in careers? Do you see that replacing a lot of junior roles, um, maybe even in, in more intermediate roles? Where, where do you see this going? I'm so I'm going to I'm going to preface this with I am one of the world's worst predictors. Uh, I, <laughs> but you I joined famously, the best startups. <laughs> I did. But I also famously at lunch at LinkedIn said the iPad is a dumb idea. Um, OK, so oh, no, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that I am always the best at, at predicting how products are going to, to work or influence things right now. You know, I think that there is a little bit more hype than there is reality around some of the AI related stuff mm-hmm. around chat G- GTP and whatnot and how, how this is actually going to play out. I think that there's um, the, the tech demos are very exciting and interesting. But on the flip side, you know, you also see it writing things that are utterly untrue and making up citations that don't exist to prove that what it said is true. Uh, and I think that, you know, mm-hmm. in the the world of software engineering right now, because GitHub's had Copilot, which is sort of, yes. I think, maybe based on some of the earlier stuff, I think that there is a opportunity right now, I can really perceive how for like in Office or in Gmail or for something like Copilot, the ability to sort of knock out a lot of Mundane task, templatized mundane mm. tasks, boilerplate kind of stuff yes. is a very straightforward way. It, you know, it's like it's autocomplete the way auto. It's magic autocomplete. It's autocomplete, yes. the but best it's going to autocomplete the whole rest of my paragraph, right? Yes. How you get from that to like replacing a junior engineer? I would still want a junior engineer to make sure mm. that what it auto completed is a thing and not yeah. just something that it made up. Uh, and so I, I'm. I guess I'm going to say I'm I live on the slightly skeptical side on the the sort of AI revolution and and how how we can turn it from interesting demos to sort of practical applications that uh, provide real value. So pretty much a tool that make our lives easier in whatever industry you work in. In that setting. Yeah, yeah. I I see a straightforward way for that, um, but for some of the sort of bigger promises that people have been making, I think. It's maybe a little premature to yeah. be cha- commenting on the the level of world changingness that can happen. But yeah. like I said, I also thought the iPad was going to be a better <laughs> idea, so. Well, we'll see where this goes. Well, uh, Chris, <laughs> thank you so much for taking your time, 45 minutes to do this interview. I really appreciate it. Tons of fun. Thank you for having me.